Okay, if you would, turn in your scriptures to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at the parable of building on the rock. That is truly the theme for today. And I thank all of you that are here and also those that listen to us across the internet and may God richly bless you today. And as I said before, but it bears worth repeating that we believe the Bible alone and in its entirety is the true Word of God. It is the living Word of God. And we serve the triune God. And that is the rock that we're building on today. Okay, if you would, follow with me. Matthew chapter 7 starts with verse 24. And this is the parable of the two builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his, rock, his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And today we're going to be talking about this parable. Jesus, in closing his teaching in, in the earlier chapters and verses in Matthew, he closed it with this parable because it is so important that we get this. And this drives home the importance of obedience to His Word. It is not enough just to hear the Word of God. But we must put it into practice. This is the action part of being a Christian. Why we know that Satan and all his demons know the Word quite well. In fact, if we remember, when Christ was tempted, Satan himself quoted scriptures to Christ to try to tempt him. And if we remember how Christ did warfare against Satan, he used the word and he put Satan back in his place. So knowing the word of God is the pro of primary importance of a Christian. And here's a sidebar. A pastor, he was taking some classes at a local college. And he engaged in a conversation with a student. And he, he said to the student, he said, let me ask you a question. He says, what do you think about this culture today? filled with ignorance and apathy. And the student said to him, I don't know and I don't really care. Bug off. Well, that is sort of a sign of the times of today's culture. People, the majority of people, and, and we talked about this, it's so funny how discipleship hour and the message intertwined because the Holy Spirit is in the house. And the Holy Spirit is flowing through the Word. But the majority of people today, as I, was, I started saying, are like the proverbial ostrich. They're standing there in the midst of everything with their head down in a hole. They're thinking it'll pass. Hopefully, it'll go away. 
Today, our society is turning people into becoming isolated and insulated. Think about this. In a high-tech age of information, we have become overloaded. The programming is being poured out from all over. It's coming at you through the newspapers, through the internet, through the magazines, uh, the radio, you name it. They're just dumping this stuff out. And I really truly believe that the world right now is run by Satan. And yes, there is an intention. It's to put you into depression. It's to put you into dependence. And it's basically to turn you into a walking zombie. Well, God don't want you like that. No. He don't want you like that. But if you buy into the culture, if you buy into the programming, that's what's going to happen to you. Getting back to the parable today, Jesus is showing us that there are two choices on which to build the house, in which to engage in building your foundation. The one is the sand, and the one is the rock. Now Jesus, in, if you look in verse 26, he warns us that this is buying into the hype. This is buying into the glitter. This is buying into all the world has to offer. And Satan, you could, you could picture Satan in, in the spiritual realm. He's dangling this thing in front of you. And he wants you to chase it. Now for any individual, it could be something different. But Satan wants you to be off on a tangent chasing something of this world. He does not want you in church today. He does not want you in discipleship hour early this morning. He does not want you in youth club tonight. He does not want you in Bible studies. He does not want you listening to Bible studies during the week. He, he just doesn't want none of that. But I see that Satan is having his, his way with this world. I see it. People are chasing after this never ceasing, always wanting more, never fulfilling fantasy, if you will. It could be money. It could be Time, it could be lust, it could be sex, it could be food, it could be possessions, it could be family, it could be job, it could be self, it could be chasing after false doctrine, and the list goes on and on. However, God tells us that this world will be destroyed with fervent heat. So, if everything that you see right now, with the exception of God's Word, that's the one thing the Scripture says, God's Word will not be destroyed in eternity. So His Word will be there. What should you be chasing after? Think about that. Building on sand is not good investment for your future. And all of us like to make good investments. In this parable, your house is self. Yeah, the, the house represents yourself. Because God has given us free will. And I know Pastor Rich talked about this numerous times. And my expression is this, darn my free will. Because my free will has gotten me into so much trouble over the years. Oh, I wish God wouldn't have gave me the free will. That he would have just like, your mind and 
set me on the path, but he gave me this free will and he gave me this physical body. And it's tough. It's tough. Uh, I, was, I was reading the book of uh, a great theologian, Spurgeon, and he says, this is way back when, many, many years ago, he said, a true person of God has to rededicate themselves daily. And as my younger brother always says, you've got to start out that day by putting on the armor. Because if you don't, if you don't know it, you're engaged in spiritual warfare. Satan wants to trip you up. He wants to take you out. He does not want you as a child of the kingdom. And we talked about this many times. What about today's society? You know, did our forefathers let us down that this whole country is getting away from the Christian values? And it's almost like, man, I would love to blame my grandpa and his grandpa and my dad, but guess what? It's me. It's me for not taking a stand, for not standing up for the Lord, for not making testimony against things against God. And I praise the Lord because... I'm looking at Missy, I'm looking at Bob and some others. They're getting involved in the culture. They're going to the school boards and they're speaking out for Christ. And this is what all of us should be doing. Okay, let's think about this. The physical world, which is self and basically Satan going against God's word, the world considers this as a wise person. We see many, you know, people that they have a doctorate and, you know, they graduated from this college and they know all this stuff and they're the utmost authority and yet they deny God. They claim to be an atheist. God's word says that they're foolish. I'm not saying that. God's word says that they are foolish because they deny God. And there's overwhelming evidence that God is true and he is present. I know uh, there's a great film, if anybody ever wants to see this, about DNA. Brother Dave Webster has it. Just looking at that film, there had to be a master creator to, to look at the smallest, the interworkings of our body. You know, anybody with common sense would say, wow. You know, it wasn't like, you know, you threw a stick of dynamite in the corner of a building and all at once, there was this perfect desk. The world would have you believe this. And they call this logic being wise. Well, God calls this foolish. The world wants you to be a wise man by their standards. They want you to be having all that you deserve. They want you to have self-gratification. They, they want you to grab for all the gusto you can get. And like Burger King, they want you to have it your way. And they'll give you the credit cards to do it. They'll give you the credit cards to do it. However, Jesus calls this stuff foolishness and he calls this stuff building on sand now Jesus talks about a wise man and I'm looking at the time here uh, we do have a little bit of time so I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 5 
And Jesus gives us a great example of being wise. And it starts like this. It's the Beatitudes. This is a picture of what we should be like in the physical realm. And this goes against what the culture teaches. This goes completely against what you've been taught, with the exception of in church or in Sunday school or in discipleship hour. Jesus saw the crowds and he went up on the mountain. And after that, he sat with his disciples and came to him. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Jesus said all this and he said, Rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven and it is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you and may I add, they put to death Jesus. Perfectly innocent man. And then Jesus goes on. And he gives us our marching orders. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? If no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men. Then he tells us, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill. You cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus, throughout the scriptures, is given us a word picture of what it is what he wants us to be like. And this is called the sanctification process. And it starts the day that you were saved. And what this is all about, and Pastor Rich said this numerous times, he said salvation is a free gift to all who believe in Christ. Repent and be baptized. The scriptures say that. But once you receive Christ as the Holy Spirit, then Pastor Rich tells us it's going to cost you everything. And how many of us are willing to give everything to Christ? Now, I don't mean you have to mortgage your house tonight. I don't mean you take your cars to the car lot and whatever. And you No. What I'm saying is you give your person to Christ. It's a spiritual battle. You give your person to Christ. Now the bad thing is, the scripture is clear, the only name that one can be saved by is Jesus. And there's many false religions today. I won't get into, it's like dozens upon dozens upon dozens. But, these people, with the exception of the Christians who believe in Jesus Christ, are on the road to eternal damnation and judgment. So they need to hear the gospel. In this life, just as Job, I think about Job, what an example. And I asked the Lord that I don't have to go through even half of what our brother Joe went through. 
But you will, in this life, experience suffering. You'll experience trials. You'll experience loss. And these traumatic times are, as in the parable, the wind coming against you, the floods coming against you, the rains coming down upon you, but God gives us His Word that they're not going to bother you because you're on the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to usher you in to eternity. He is going to be the one waiting for you. And some of us, He's going to be the one that is going to be calling us up in the clouds and with a, in an instant. And this is really something that I look forward to. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed to be like Him. I know some of you are going to be sad. You're going to lose this earthly tent. You're going to lose this body. You're going to lose the aches. You're going to lose the bad back. We're going to have eternal bodies. We're going to be just like Him. And, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I know some of you are. Some of you think, oh, man, I hate to lose this beautiful body of mine. You know, yeah, right. <laughs> well, we know better. But the wise man, Jesus said, he will deliver us. He is guaranteeing it through his word. And the choice is easy. The choice is easy. It's the deal of a lifetime. The deal of a lifetime. Spend eternity where things are going to be beyond our imagination. The greatness of it all. And we're going to be over worlds. I don't know what it's going to be like because God says in, in your deepest imaginations you cannot fathom the greatness how it's going to be. So I really look forward to this but for the time being we must persevere and we must stand strong and looking at the time here I have time for this story. There was a time in my younger day I was going about my merry way and I was involved with the Lord. I was like at the beginning of Sanctification Road, if you will. And I took a blow deep to my heart. And my brother did too. My dad was 57. He went off on a skiing trip. And he never came back. And it chokes me up to even talk about it. And this tore me apart. And that same night that God took him, I was ready to crash my truck over the Outer Bridge Crossing going into... Brooklyn, if you will, Staten Island. And for the longest time, I thought that God took my dad instead of me. I was that stupid. And I just, I, I just couldn't come to ends with this thing. And I felt all this guilt that my dad, God took my dad instead of me. And... I look at it now, it was stupid, but it was me. That goes to say, I was stupid, yes. So what happened, I went into this deep depression. I didn't want to show it to anybody. How you doing, Bobby? I'm doing good. Yeah, yeah I was doing good. No, I was hurting. I just couldn't, couldn't put a period on the bottom of this thing. Couldn't understand why God took my dad. 
I was mad. And I wrestled with this. And I wrestled with this. And finally, it never happened since. And it never happened before this time. This goes back probably going on 20, 20, 20 plus years, 25 years ago. I woke up in the middle of my sleep. And there I was at the house, at my dad's house. And I looked out back, and there stood my dad. And he looked like Pastor Rich always says. Pastor Rich says, you're going to be around 35. Well, there my dad was. And I said, Daddy, you're supposed to be dead. What are you doing? And he went like this. He never spoke one word, but I knew what he was saying. He went like this. So I come out in the backyard. I said, Daddy, Daddy, what happened? You're supposed to be dead. He goes, he never spoke a word, but telepathically he said, Son, you got to keep going. I was your earthly father for a small amount of time. You got to focus on your true father, your heavenly father. And I said, but daddy, daddy. He goes, listen, son. He goes, focus on Jesus as your heavenly father, and I will see you soon. And I'm like, daddy, daddy, don't go, don't go, don't go. I woke up. I woke up. Now, is that scripture based? No. That was my personal experience. And the first thing that happened, I knew through the Holy Spirit, I had to talk to that man back there, my younger brother and my older brother. And I had to tell him what her dad said. That we were supposed to persevere until the end. Because we're going to be with Jesus real soon. This life is but a blink. This life is but a small shadow of things to come. And it's gone so fast. Now I know that truly motivated me. And it impacted my life to the point where I got over myself and I focused on Jesus because in my stupidity my dad come back by the grace of Jesus Christ and pointed me back in the right direction so in closing I want to point you in the right direction that this world is trying just to gather you up and to choke you out. But don't go along with this world. Focus on Jesus. Focus on His Word. Get to the events where you can grow in Christ. I'll never forget some lady came up when my son Ryan, he was coming out of high school and he was, you know, not, not to, you know, make him pride for whatever. But he was this great academic student. He was straight A's. And everybody says, oh, he got to go to college. And he got to do this. And he got to do that. And I'll never forget, my wife Beth, she said to this person, she said, my number one thing that I'm worried about is his relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. And she just like, she couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it either. Words of wisdom out of the wife. And a lot of times the Holy Spirit will do that. 
He'll speak in and through people that surround you. Be open for His Word. Be open for His teaching. So, in closing, I want you to be hungry for His Word. Have an ongoing, earnest desire to do the will of God. And God says that He will continue to feed you. So with that, I'm going to close. Let us all rise for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of giving this message. And I just say thank you, Jesus, for your word. Because without your word, we would all be lost. But Lord, you bless us with your word. We have a sure foundation. We are building on a rock. And Lord, it's through faith that we know that one day we will be with you in glory. And until that day, Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to, to guide us and lead us in the righteous path of you. And as we study your word, lead us into new truths, into deeper depths of your word. And Father, I just praise you for all that you're doing in and through us. And Lord, I ask that you continue to expand our boundaries. And Lord, we rededicate ourselves to you this day. And Lord, continue to give us a hunger for you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.